So a warm welcome to our co-sponsors, our speakers and attendees. My name is Kelly Russo. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of the American Bar Association's Commission on Homelessness and Poverty. Um, for those of you who don't know, our, our mission really is to increase access to legal services for those experiencing homelessness and poverty through various initiatives, sharing best practices, and really engaging advocates like yourself across the country. So while today's focus is on the criminalization of poverty, our other initiatives focus on areas like anti-poverty efforts, veterans, and youth. Um, a shameless plug while I have your attention, we are working with the National Homelessness Law Center to expand our youth-specific work through our Homeless Youth Legal Network. So I encourage everyone on the call to join our listserv in order to learn more and stay connected. Um, I'll be sure to put the info in the chat for you to join. So again, welcome to our program today on the City of Grants Pass v. Johnson. Our speakers will really focus on what you need to know about this Supreme Court case, why it matters, and what you can do about it. Uh, before I pass the mic, uh, just a few housekeeping items. A recording will be made available after today's webinar. We encourage you to share it far and wide. Captions for those who need it are enabled, so to turn them on, you can just click the more button at the bottom right of your screen. If you have any specific questions throughout the course of the webinar, please put them in the Q&A. The chat is available as well for attendees to engage with one another. This will be the first of a series of webinars about the case. Uh, we really invite you to reach out to us, the commission, as well as the National Homelessness Law Center, if there are any specific issue areas that you'd like to see programming around. Now I'll pass the mic over to the chair of the ABA's Commission on Homelessness and Poverty, Michael Santos, and he'll int introduce you to our speakers and, and get us started. Michael? Thanks so much, Kelly. Can you hear me okay? Great. So as Kelly said, I'm the current chair of the American Bar Association's Commission on Homelessness and Poverty. I'm also the Associate Director of U.S. Policy at Results Educational Fund, a national grassroots lobbying organization that helps create the political will to end poverty in Congress. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Again, as Kelly said, we're here to learn more about this most significant case, Supreme Court case about the rights of people experiencing homelessness in decades. That's the city of Grants Pass versus Johnson. Um, before I call on with uh, call on the panelists, I just want to you know say as a reminder that the American Bar Association opposes laws and policies that punish people experiencing homelessness for carrying out otherwise life-sustaining uh, practices um, or acts in public spaces like eating, sitting, sleeping, or camping when there are no alternative spaces, private spaces available. Um, the ABA also has 10 guidelines on court fines and fees to ensure that fines and fees are fairly imposed and administered and that the justice system does not punish people for the crime of poverty or for being poor. Now, I know we don't have a lot of time together. We'll have the panelists answer a few questions and open it up for Q&A towards the end. But in the course of this webinar, we also want to hear from you and get to know you. And, and I appreciate many of you introducing yourself, where you're from on the chat. I encourage you to um, use the chat to introduce yourselves, where you're from, any concerns you have about the case, um, how this case is going to affect you and your communities, uh, what you're already seeing about how your communities are punishing or finding alternative ways instead of punishing unhoused people. Uh, so before I turn it over to our distinguished panel, um, I have a few polling questions that I'm hoping my colleagues could actually help me launch. So uh, why don't we go ahead and um, pull, put out the first poll. So for those of you who are attending this webinar, um, the first question I have is, uh, or two questions, right? The first one is that you know, I, how much do you agree with the following statement? I have knowledge or I'm familiar with laws that punish people for their experience of homelessness and poverty, those sleeping outside and or unhoused. And the choices are you can strongly disagree, disagree, you're neutral, don't have mixed feelings about this, you agree or you strongly agree. The second question that we have for you, and this is more to for us to really get to know who's in the room today, is how do you identify yourself or your professional affiliation? And you can check as many boxes as you want, um, uh, whether you're a person with lived experience of homelessness and or poverty, uh, you work for the federal, for the federal, state, or local government, um, you work in the nonprofit space, uh, you're part of a faith-based group. Uh, you're a lawyer or a legal advocate. 
um, you're a grassroots or a concerned citizen, uh, or you're in academia, or if none of that applies, you can select the other box. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna give it another thirty seconds uh, for folks to answer these two questions, um, and then we'll move along with the rest of our program today. All right, so give it a couple more seconds. Go ahead and share the results if that's possible. Great, so it looks like several people have you know, some understanding, knowledge of laws that punish people for experiencing homelessness. Um, and we actually have a mixed group of people attending this webinar, uh, mostly from the nonprofit space, some lawyers, some non-lawyers, a lot of grassroots. That's really great to hear and see. Um, and, and so we'll we'll have material that will be helpful in whatever line of work that you're doing um, to advocate for opposing laws that criminalize and punish people experiencing homelessness. Um, so a good rule of thumb to carry forward in this webinar is that it's as Kelly mentioned earlier, you know, this is part of a series of programming that we will be doing. Um, and it's not just about the case itself, but what's been going on before what before this case even came into existence and what to expect after, right? There's a lot to unpack that we can't just do in like this one webinar. So this is just the tip of the iceberg and we'd love to hear more from you if you have ideas and what other types of programming, related programming that you'd like to see in the future. So. Um, without further ado, I'm going to call on my colleagues who will be on this panel. That's Will Knight from the National Homelessness Law Center, Kirsten Anderson, um, Deputy Legal Director from Southern Poverty Law Center, and also a commissioner with the ADA, Commission on Homelessness and Poverty, uh, David Peary, Executive Director of Miami Coalition to Advance Racial Equity, um, and Jesse Rabinowitz, the Campaign and Communications Director in the National Homelessness Law Center. Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so to kick us off, the city of Grants Pass versus Johnson has a lot of history and context before it even got to the Supreme Court. What's going on here? Can you, can you start with the big picture and talk about the underlying facts of this case? Um, maybe Will or Jesse, you wanna take those questions? Jesse, do you wanna kick it off? Sure. Thanks so much, Michael. As Michael mentioned, my name is Jesse. I see him as pronouns and I work at the National Homelessness Law Center. I want to start by talking about Grants Pass. Grants Pass is a small town in Oregon. There are about 40,000 people who live there. And like in most cities in America, about half of the renters there struggle to pay rent every month. In Oregon, in Grants Pass, like cities, um, there's no shelter for folks who are experiencing homelessness. The only place where people can go is a gospel rescue mission where you have to work six hours a day, six days a week, go to church twice a day, and pay $100 a month to live there. And if you're too sick or too disabled to work, you can't stay there at all, which means that more people than ever are sleeping outside. Instead of responding to an increase in homelessness with compassion, housing, services, the city, the city of Grants Pass decided to give people tickets of around $350 for camping outside. And they took a really broad definition of what camping means. And as we can go on to the next slide, we'll see that this is literally about if people can be punished for using something like a blanket, a cardboard box, or a pillow when they're sleeping outside. People experiencing homelessness in Grants Pass thought that this wasn't fair. And with our partners at the Oregon Justice Center, uh, sued the city and the court agreed, the Ninth Circuit Court agreed, and they said, if you're not going to meet people's basic needs of housing or shelter, punishing them for trying to stay warm or safe outside is cruel and unusual. Unfortunately, politicians and elected officials and powerful members of the communities are convinced that we can punish our way out of homelessness and that we can force people to not be homeless anymore by throwing them in jail or by giving them a ticket. Um, 
and the court filings are very clear. The, the officials in Grants Pass are not mincing words in the court filings. They literally say, our goal is to make Grants Pass so uncomfortable that homeless people won't want to stay here. We don't care where they go um, as long as they're not here. So that's how we got to where we are today. These powerful uh, cities, states, lobbyist organizations convinced the Supreme Court that this was a case worthy of hearing. Um, so in April, April, in late April, the Supreme Court will take up this case. This is the most important case about homelessness in at least 40 years and really asks the basic question, does the Constitution's protection against cruel and unusual punishment apply to people who are experiencing homelessness? We think that it does. Every time a court has heard this, they have agreed. We do not think this is controversial. Um, but we think this is hugely important. But we want to be really clear that even in a best case scenario where the court says you can't punish people for sleeping outside, the court's not going to create any housing. The court's not going to create any shelters. So we're using this as an opportunity not only to win the case, but build a public messaging, build a public power, and build a political will needed to ensure that win or lose, again, we want to win, we think we can win, but win or lose, we need to do more as a country to end homelessness. So we're so excited to be with you all here today. This is the biggest webinar that we have ever done at the Law Center. We have over a thousand people who have RSVP'd. We have actually hit our capacity on webinar registrants, which has never happened before. And we think this shows that people are interested, people are fired up, and people want to work with us, not only to win the case, but to build the power to end homelessness. So we're excited to spend the next chunk of time going into more of the specifics about the case. Thank you so much for being here, and I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. Thanks so much, Jesse, for that context. Um, now that this case is in this in front of the Supreme Court, what is the issue that the court is trying to decide? I know Jesse, I talked about you know what is going on in the local level. Like, what is what what is the court looking at at this point? So, I'll, actually, I'll I'll take that if I can, Jesse. Um, uh, and Will Knight, uh, decriminalization director for the National Homelessness Law Center, uh, I use he, him pronouns. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, what we're showing right now on this slide is the question presented. This is the actual question that the Supreme Court certified in this case. That language up on top, the language that's not highlighted, that's advocacy. That's how the question was framed. That bottom part, though, that, that last sentence that's highlighted, that is the exact question that the Supreme Court has certified. So the the Short and simple answer to your question, Michael, is exactly that, that the, the court is, like Jesse said, taking up the question of whether the Eighth Amendment, uh, the Eighth Amendment protects, uh, prohibits cities from punishing uh, unhoused people for existing when they have nowhere else to exist. Um, before I, I get too far into the weeds on that, though, I want to pull out a little bit um, and I want to acknowledge how we got here. We got here because this country has, unfortunately, a long history with marginalizing, uh, criminalizing, and invisibilizing poor people. And, and that history has, uh, the brunt of it has been borne by Black people and by people of color. Um, we have a long history with criminal laws and uh, litigation all the way through the Supreme Court and down policy discussions about vagrancy laws, about panhandling criminalization. Uh, a lot of other nuanced constitutional issues like uh, the right to travel, uh, things, uh, principles we refer to as state-created danger. Uh, there are even other parts of the Eighth Amendment that are issue in a lot of these different lawsuits. And you're going to hear from some of my colleagues about how some other cases have been impacted by those different legal theories. Um, and you're also going to hear more about what this really is about, uh, about invisibilizing and punishing or people. Um, like Jesse was saying, and this is an exact quote from the legislative record here, Grants Pass was intentionally trying. This is this is from the uh, the council that passed these ordinances. It's a quote. The point is to make it uncomfortable enough for them in our city so they will want to move on down the road. That's a direct quote. So that's exactly what it's about. I want to talk just a little bit about what it's not about, and then I'm going to give it back to Michael. But uh, when I say what it's not about, I'm only referring to the question that's in front of the Supreme Court right now, uh, because it is 
broadly, these issues are, are, they can't be disentangled. They're intertwined with our history of marginalizing and criminalizing vulnerable communities. Um, but right now, this case is not about uh, things you might have heard in the road to the Supreme Court about class certification uh, or, or voluntariness or involuntariness, uh, the myth of voluntary homelessness, like I, as I like to say. Um, it is not about whether these cases are preventing cities from doing affirmative policy to help the unhoused population, like providing housing first policy solution, permanent supportive housing options, wraparound services. Uh, a lot of the folks who weighed in and convinced the Supreme Court to hear this case made that argument, but that's false. Uh, these, the Grant's past decision, the Ninth Circuit's opinion in this case and its predecessor, Martin v. Boise, and the case that came before it, they, they only stand for the principle, very narrow principle and unobjectionable principle, that it is cruel to punish people for existing when they have nowhere else to go. Uh, that's the question in front of the court. Grant's past bet big on this. They kept it that narrow. So none of these other things are at issue in front of the court because they think that they can win. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes in April. Um, you all probably can guess how I feel about it, but uh, that's the issue in front of the court right now. And I'll give it back to Michael. Thanks so much, Will. Um, you had touched on this idea of homelessness as you know an involuntary status or, or i guess you know some cities are saying that people are experiencing are voluntarily experiencing homelessness right um and the impact of enforcing sleeping or camping bans against people experiencing homelessness um can you can you and this is a question for David Peary. David, can you speak about this like issue about the homelessness as an involuntary status? Is that something that you can uh, talk briefly about? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, this is huge. This is the major, um, for lack of a better word, fulcrum um, issue in, in terms of um, homelessness. Uh, if people are voluntarily leaving the safety and security turned into the streets, then that really deprives us of all arguments um, for um, housing as a human right, uh, for housing first solutions, and open door to criminalization. So the answer to that, the hey, medical- David, so sorry to interrupt. Your audio is a bit it? jarbled. I'm wondering if maybe turn um, off your camera. So I will reveal to- Okay, is that any better? Is that any better? Oh, okay. Um, sorry. So I'll be in the black. So um, what I was saying is that th this is a fundamental and, and urgent issue, extremely important, vital issue to um, 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 that, that decides how policies are, are going to be made. Um, if you believe that folks are voluntarily out there on, on the streets, then it opens the door to criminalization. That opens the um, door to um, opposing um, housing as a human right, and it also opens the door to opposing um, housing first solutions. Um, I will reveal to the audience that I have been homeless. I, I have slept on the streets of Miami, uh, uh, actually specifically on the sidewalks of of Miami for uh, for several years, and so I have a personal experience um, with uh, understanding of being homeless um, from a personal perspective. It is traumatizing, deeply traumatizing, and you are, and that that trauma is compounded on a daily basis. Um, to to me, the idea that that folks are out there voluntarily, that they leave the safety and security of a locked door, where their possessions are now being stolen, like on a daily, if not weekly, basis, where they're vulnerable to to violence. Um, I believe every person I've ever um, spoken with who has been homeless. Um, has either been a victim of or personally witnessed violence. Um, the guy um, whom, whom I slept next to um, for much of the time I was on the streets had his head bashed in one morning by um, at two, three o'clock in the morning by um, someone who was um, pissed that, uh, excuse me, disgruntled that um, um, he owed him like a five dollars uh, a five dollar debt. So everyone has a story about violence. Why would anyone willingly leave the safety and security of their home to sleep unsheltered on the city streets? Now, there may be some people 
who will go off to the you know off the grid to the woods or, or to um, Idaho or Montana or someplace like that you know in order to live a nomadic lifestyle and I'll certainly grant that but in the 15 years that, that I've been involved in this issue and the thousands of people that I have met who have been uh, who have, uh, experienced homelessness, not a single one is out there willingly and voluntarily. So this is um, an absolutely, um, in my opinion, reckless and dangerous myth that there are voluntary urban homeless, that there's people out there voluntarily um, experiencing um, um, homelessness. Um, it's also personally offensive, and I have to confess, I probably have um, a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> Part of me is probably still uh, um, experiencing that trauma that, that's on the streets, but it, it, it is absolutely offensive. And I also would assert that it also has racist underpinnings to it, because homelessness is looked at, is viewed at as personally irresponsible. Even though people think that, that most of the homeless are drug addicts and, and, and mentally ill crazy people. Um, they also think that they're personally irresponsible, that, that, that they simply want free stuff. And so this myth you have to examine really goes to the very heart of how people um, become poor and how, how our system manufactures poverty and breeds homelessness. Um, so um, again, don't lose sight of the fact that that it's completely outrageous to think that folks would voluntarily subject themselves to such pain and suffering. And second of all, look at the underlying racist implications, racial, if not racist implications that, that are being asserted there. Thanks so much, David. And thank you so much for sharing your story um, and, and for being vulnerable and, you know, and, and in this group. Um, just as a follow-up question, you know, this came this case came from the Ninth Circuit, right? This is like came from the West Coast, which we see a lot on the news and the media about how homelessness has just skyrocketed in the West Coast. Um, and it originated from Grants Pass in Oregon. But are the issues in this case seen in other places across the country? Can you talk briefly? Uh, you had you kind of touched on like Montana and Idaho, but can you talk about that a little? Absolutely. Um, um, in my um, day job, so to speak, I also serve as the um, interim national director of community organizing for the um, National Coalition for the Homeless. Um, I think, as most folks know, not everyone on this call knows, the um, nation's oldest um, advocacy um, organization um, um, representing the um, interests of um, those who are experiencing homelessness. And I've had occasion to um, travel and speak throughout the country. And, and I can say that these issues in the Ninth Circuit are being played out quite literally in, in, in uh, I, I would say, just about every municipality, every county, every locality um, that you can think of. Um, so, so what's happening in the Ninth Circuit in this relatively small community of Grants Pass um, is being replicated right here in Miami, for instance. Um, the um, uh, city of Miami, and, and particularly the city of Miami Beach, are on steroids in terms of um, um, criminalization of, of homelessness. Um, the um, city of Miami Beach, for instance, has um, purportedly logged about 400 arrests of the homeless. And this is against the backdrop of having only about 150 unsheltered homeless living in the city. And this is in, in six weeks. Um, and they contract only 75 shelter beds. So um, this question of whether the police, wh whether it violates the um, cruel and unusual punishment clause of the Eighth Amendment to arrest people who are unhoused, um, even if no shelter is available, is a critical question, is, is, is truly a momentous question for all cities nationwide, um, primarily because the knee-jerk reaction, as I think as um, Jesse uh, mentioned, is to hide homelessness, is, is, is not to solve it by giving people homes. In fact, that's the only way to solve homelessness is through homes, but to hide it, to sweep it under the rug. So that's why folks, um, that's why cities and municipalities focus mostly on temporary emergency shelter, 30 to 60 to, to 90 day shelter. Um, emergency shelter is not the answer to ending homelessness. At best, it simply connects people with services. 
at worst, it, it um, um, is, is practically useless for the people who are chronically homeless who have been out in the streets for, for a year or more. So, um, yes, this, these issues are fundamental across the United States. Thanks so much, David. Just a quick follow up question, because I want to tease this out a little bit. When we talk about criminalization and punishing, it's not just coming into contact with um, the criminal justice system. Are when, when people are getting arrested or ticketed, like, does that mean that they're also getting fines and fees? Like, is that is that the case that you're seeing as well? Absolutely. Um, actually, any encounter with the criminal justice system um, tends to have very negative consequences, regardless of whether you're arrested or, or, or not. Um, as someone who has experienced homelessness, I, I can tell you that that um, um, we view the police as both protector and predator that police often are, um, uh, as, as the enforcement mechanism of the state in the unenviable un un uh, um, position of being just as um, negative and adverse to someone experiencing homelessness as, um, as someone who's trying to rob them, somebody who's trying to steal their um, um, possessions, um, someone who is um, trying to um, uh, assault them. Because those are the things that that um, people experiencing homelessness fear from when they encounter a police officer. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, many times that's exactly what happens. Fines are very, very um, um, pernicious and, and extremely adverse and extremely harmful. Um, what craziness is it to find somebody who is so poor as to not being able to afford a roof over their head and then you saddle them with a two, three, four hundred, five hundred dollar fine. I mean, to me, that, does, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. How can they possibly pay it? And it, with most municipalities, what happens if you don't pay a fine, then it, it gets turned over to a um, collection agency. And so it follows you. And it ruins what poor credit that you have anyway. And these things will often show up in terms of employment um, searches. Uh, many employers will, will look at um, credit history. So, so the fines um, part of it um, is, is um, potentially just as adverse as the incarceration component of criminalization. But just the mere encounter in and of itself is bad. Um, I, I know, I, I recall police coming through encampments at three or four o'clock in the morning and demanding to see IDs from everyone. Um, and, and they will not take no for an answer. They'll shine that, that, that light in your face. And, and, and that does nothing except to um, contribute more towards the fear and uh, more towards the trauma and also towards the um, 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 resentment um, of the police. And also it contributes uh, mentally and physically to um, sleep deprivation. And by Thanks the so way, much. the sleep deprivation is really one of the worst parts of being homeless, by the way. Thank you so much, David. Um, I want to turn to my colleague, Kirsten. Kirsten, I, I have this one question for you. How does this case relate to the legal, you know, just switching gears a little bit, how does this case relate to the legal protections available to people who have no choice but to live on the streets? Thanks, uh, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kirsten Anderson. I'm the Deputy Legal Director for Economic Justice from the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I have worked uh, for many years um, in, in the Deep South and in particularly in Florida on issues related to criminalization of homelessness, and I'm going to just take um, us through the legal issues that are uh, really at issue under the Eighth Amendment specifically for sleeping. I've seen a lot of questions in the chat about other legal protections like uh, people's property and things like that, which are not going to be impacted. Um, we're going to still have the Fourth Amendment, for example, that against unlawful seizures um, and, uh, you know, of property and, and other constitutional protections. But just to talk about the Eighth Amendment for a minute. Um, in, in this opinion, the court found that the city of Grants Pass can't, consistent with the Eighth Amendment, enforce anti-camping ordinances against homeless persons for the mere act of sleeping outside with rudimentary protection from the elements. This is the blankets that you heard Will mention, uh, when there's no other place in the city for them to go. And so let, let's think about that for a minute. Um, all human beings need sleep. Sleep is life-sustaining in that it is something that we are all biologically compelled to do. It must occur at some time and at some place in a 24 hour 
sleep wake cycle. Uh, as you heard David talk about, sleep deprivation causes significant impacts um, to people's health and in ex extreme cases, death. Um, those of us who have access to permanent or temporary housing sleep indoors in a bed with pillows and sheets and blankets. We're protected from the elements by four walls and a roof. And blankets are necessary not only for protection from the elements, especially when indoors, but to regulate our core body temperature. There's actually a, a biological need. Um, and so when we have a situation where, where uh, in our country, where many people have been deprived of housing, um, if they have access to temporary emergency shelters where they can sleep at night, um, then they have an alternative. But in most places in our country, we don't have sufficient shelter beds to meet the need. And, and I saw some of these questions in the chat, they're often not adequate or even accessible to meet people's needs. Um, sometimes there's time limits, sometimes there's costs, sometimes you can't go in if you have a family or children. Um, you know, sometimes they have uh, rules that impact people with, with disabilities. Um, this leaves many individuals with no choice but to sleep on our streets and in our parks and other public spaces at night. And the, the, this basic principle underlying the grant's past case is that a person can't be punished for conduct that's involuntary or is an unavoidable consequence of that involuntary status. So this uh, concept derives from a number of Supreme Court cases. It's been interpreted by other federal appeals courts that, for example, people can't be punished for medical condition, such as alcoholism. Um, or in a Ninth Circuit case that Grants Pass interprets and applies, Martin versus City of Boise, where Martin held that the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause prohibits the imposition of criminal penalties for sitting, sleeping, or lying outside on public property for homeless in individuals who cannot obtain shelter. Now, uh, one of the things that the court noted is that the city of Grants Pass was trying to uh, evade Martin by distinguishing between sleeping outside and sleeping outside with bedding, such as a blanket. So they're saying, okay, yeah, fine, sleeping's involuntary, but a person can choose to sleep without bedding and therefore can be prosecuted for sleeping with bedding. And the court rejected that, um, finding that this is essentially involuntary conduct, sleeping with bedding and materials, if it's an unavoidable consequence of one's status, in this case being involuntarily homeless. And uh, as noted by uh, Will and Jesse, the court recognized this as a narrow right, limited to the plaintiff's right to basic protections against the elements. Um, Generally, just to when courts have applied these principles in sleeping cases that I know a number of folks on this call have litigated, I have litigated, um, these cases tend to turn on demonstrating to the court that homelessness itself is involuntary, which, as uh, David noted, that's sort of a ridiculous concept um, that we even have to demonstrate that. Um, that sleeping outdoors is involuntary. Um, for example, you might do that by showing that the number of homeless people exceed the number of available shelter beds or when shelters otherwise practically available. And, um, you know, basically it all boils down to the fact that human beings need sleep and the legal protections at issue in this case are whether people can be punished for having no alternative but to sleep outside. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Um, just as a follow-up question, and I know David had touched on this earlier, like how would the court's decision impact what states and local communities are doing to address homelessness? Uh, thanks so much, uh, Michael, for that question. Um, I think that the people on this call know better than anyone the ways in which this will impact states and local communities. I think this is why we had so much interest in this webinar. And um, if you live in a state or city or county where the issue of homelessness, what to do about camps uh, or people who are otherwise forced to sleep outside, um, where sleeping or camping ordinances are being proposed either in your state, city, or county, um, I invite you to just post the, the city and state in the chat um, and we can kind of take stock of that. Um, but what I'll say is that the most significant impact is that depending on what the court does, it could call into question this basic principle that there's really a limit on, um, you know, whether or not you can arrest someone just because they are sleeping outside in the absence of alternatives and whether that's unconstitutional or under the Eighth Amendment. Um, the principles kind of underlying this decision 
have been embodied or, or embedded in uh, policymaking and municipal ordinances that we see really across the country. There's sort of just this general recognition that you have to offer other alternatives to jailing people, either shelter or housing. And in kind of a newer wave of, of regulations, I think that's why we're starting to see um, state sanctioned encampments, um, which pose their own um, concerns, um, kind of even outside the Eighth Amendment. Um, but they kind of implicitly recognize this idea that people must be lawfully allowed to exist somewhere. Um, and not only is jailing people the cruelest response to homelessness, as David pointed out, but it's also the costliest, and it costs way more to treat homelessness as a criminal justice issue than to actually provide the housing and services people need. Um, and the human costs are incredibly high. Um, our organization, Southern Poverty Law Center, just put out a report centering voices of people experiencing homelessness in Georgia and the impacts of criminalization, and we'll send out the link to that. It's called Sheltering and Injustice. Um, and I will point out that there are other legal protections that could continue to constrain cities and counties in their responses to homelessness, um, such as, you know, this city still can't throw away your, your belongings. Um, you know, there's still uh, religious freedom protections for churches and uh, religious ministries, for example, um, who are offering uh, support and, and aid. Um, we still have this thing called the due process clause in the 14th Amendment. Um, but there's no question that the impacts will be huge of the Supreme Court weighing in on the applicability of the Eighth Amendment. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, I want to throw this question back to Will. Um, how can lawyers and other advocates get involved? You know, let's start with the case first, right? Because I think this is like the tip of the iceberg. How can lawyers and other advocates get involved with the case? Are, are there opportunities to get involved at this point? And what's the, I think we've seen some questions in the chat about like, what's the timeline um, of this case? You have alluded to it about uh, the Supreme Court hearing it in April. So maybe you can talk about that briefly. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there is a lot that needs to be done. Uh, I'm really glad to see that there has been so much outreach and that there are so many people on this call because we have the community out here to to help persuade the court to see the, the truth behind the struggle of the unsheltered people. But um, we need am amiki, bottom line. Please reach out as soon as possible. If you have reached out, you probably heard from us already. If not, you're about to be hearing from us. Um, one of the biggest things I wanna flag, if there are firms with capacity to help that we need right now, uh, is there are about 10 or 15 different groups that need only need counsel of record. They they have lawyers in their network who've worked with them in the past. They are writing good briefs on good issues, and we need those briefs in. But they don't have anyone who is admitted to practice at the Supreme Court, and they don't have uh, legal support staff to help with uh, rule compliance, with, with formatting and filing. Uh, we do need specifically uh, anyone who has capacity to, to hopefully volunteer to take on a portion of those we're also working at the law center to make sure we have capacity to help with that as well. Those are the biggest immediate needs from a legal perspective. I think Jesse's going to talk a little bit more about advocacy uh, that we can do in front of other decision makers and policymakers. Thank you, Will. Um, before I actually turn it over to Jesse to talk about that, um, what I, I do, I, al I always love asking this question. I think this is, comes from like my gra working with grassroots organizers. Um, what, but what is the call to action to the legal community? And maybe Kirsten, I don't know if you have anything to to say about this. Thanks, uh, Michael. Um, yes, I think that um, I know. I know maybe about. 30% of the participants who joined us or joined our poll today um, are part of the legal community. And I, I think one way that's really significant is that it's really important to note uh, that in this case, it was really a bipartisan effort to have the Supreme Court accept um, cert and, and accept this case. Uh, there were uh, um, Democrat attorney generals who um, petitioned the court. Um, this this is really um, a bipartisan issue in terms of supporting criminalizing homelessness. And a lot of Democrat-led cities, especially on the West Coast, have uh, been peddling the false notion 
that this um, decision is what is standing in the way of them being able to make progress on homelessness in their cities. Um, th this notion that the courts are standing in the way of real solutions to homelessness is false. And we need to be clear that jailing people because they're too poor to afford housing um, is unacceptable. Uh, punishing people for being human beings who need sleep undermines the rule of law. Having a country where a growing proportion of our population cannot afford housing undermines the rule of law. Having a country um, where we have public debates that dehumanates people because they don't have housing undermines the rule of law. I think of the quote by Anatoly France, the law and its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges. For lawyers, I think the question is, does the rule of law protect us all or does it not? And as lawyers, we need you to raise your voices and use your power and privilege and get loud. We need lawyers to, as Will said, volunteer to write amicus briefs, host community conversations about these issues and the legal implications of policies under review in our states and our communities, volunteer with local legal aid or civil rights organizations helping homeless people in your community um, defend themselves against criminalization, testify at commission meetings and at legislatures. Uh, the, the, there are state bills uh, you know, under consideration across uh, our country trying to criminalize camping and sleeping at the state level. Um, and we need we need to fight back against that. We need lawyers to uh, write op eds, and we need lawyers to demand research based solutions to address homelessness in 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 their communities, in their professional associations, at your churches, at your civic organizations, everywhere where you have access um, to use your voice. Um, so those are just I think um, some of the calls to action for the legal community that's really demanded by this case. So may, may, may I quickly um, to just add to, to something real, real, real brief to um, um, Kirsten's um, comments? Um, it is notable, uh, as Kirsten noted, that um, criminalization of homelessness is one of the few areas of bipartisan consensus. Um, so you'll see in red states as well as blue states um, criminalization efforts. Um, and you'll also hear among liberals as well as conservatives their disdain for the homeless. Um, even ones that, that, that purport to have compassion will harbor down deep, and probably a lot of people on this call, that there is something wrong with this person, that this per why this person is out there on the streets. And we must do something to force them into acceptable behavior. Um, we need to change that narrative. It's fundamental that we need to change that narrative. It's not the person so much that's broken, it's the system that is broken. A minimum wage system that does not allow for a livable wage, an out of control um, um, affordable housing crisis um, where um, um, rents are about triple, have tripled just in the last two years. Um, a healthcare system, predatory healthcare system that denies uh, life giving care to um, adult males between 22 and 64. It's, it's a broken system that must be corrected, not the individuals. Thank you, David. Um, I want to turn to Jesse. I know, and, and really going back to what I had said earlier at the very beginning of the, the top the, the hour when we started this webinar, right? This is the case is just the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot to unpack. And this is going to be a series of webinar programming that we'll be doing about the case, about like the criminalization of homelessness and punishing people experiencing homelessness. Um, but how the court decides this case will have an impact and far reaching consequences in how we as a society address homelessness in the United States. Um, the question, Jesse, is like, what can advocates do outside of this case? And what's the call to action, if there's any, for grassroots activists and advocates, those who are not lawyers or who really want to you know, support the work, uh, the broader movement of addressing criminalization? Thanks so much, Michael. Logan, if I could have you pull up that map. Um, I want to zoom out a little bit. And as David started to mention, as folks have been talking about, we need to be very clear that there is a well-funded billionaire-backed national campaign to criminalize homelessness in cities and states across the country. In the past few weeks, we have seen anti-homeless bills introduced in Iowa, Indiana, Kentucky, a new one in Arizona. Things are bad out there. This is, But it's not organic, right? There is a movement trying to do this. 
I want to shout out Kentucky for having perhaps the worst version of this. But to be clear, all of these are very bad. Kentucky's proposed law says that if someone experiencing homelessness is on your property, you can use force and even deadly force to remove them. You can kill someone experiencing homelessness if they're on your property. That to me is not an acceptable solution. And this is something that we need everyone's help in. I am not a lawyer, right? I understood maybe 50% of the stuff that the smart lawyers were talking about. But what I understand is that when we are, I, I, and I, like, I'm a social worker. And what I know is that when we punish people, we, we push them further into homelessness and further into poverty, but there are real solutions. We need to be loud. We've been talking to elected officials and people across the country about this case. And what we're learning is that no one has even heard of this case. So the first thing we need everyone's help is, is talking about the case. We have set up a website, www.johnsonvgrantspass.com, that has information about the case. It has ways you can get involved. But the first thing we need your help with is making sure people all across the country know that there's an important case going to the Supreme Court. Um, we need you to join our movement, not only to win this case, but to defeat these billionaire-backed bills. Head to housingnothandcuffs.com to join our campaign. There's also a link to that on the Johnson v. Grants Pass website. We need you not only in the fight until the Supreme Court case is over, but in the fight until every person in this country has housing that meets their needs. We need your help. In D.C., we're going to have a rally in D.C. on the day of the oral arguments, either April 22nd, 23rd, or 24th. Hop on a bus, join us in D.C. It's going to be an incredibly powerful opportunity to show the country that the movement to end homelessness with compassion and services is stronger than this group of people who wants to arrest people who can't afford to have a place to live. I want to name that this is happening across the country. And I just have to name that as a DC voter, as a DC resident, today is the one year anniversary of when President Biden and DC Mayor Muriel Bowser cleared 50 people from a park a few blocks away from the White House and arrested two homeless veterans. This is happening across the country and we need to build our power to defeat it. As David was saying, people think that homelessness is a choice. It is a choice. It's a choice made by our elected officials at every level of government who continue to fail to fund the housing that is needed to end homelessness. But I firmly believe that together we can build a base of support needed not only to stop the criminalization of homelessness, but to fund the housing we know that everyone needs. If you head over to our website, johnsonvgrantspass.com, there is a way for folks to get involved, show up, join us, contact us, we're doing a video project to collect stories from people with lived experience of homelessness about how criminalization has impacted their life. If that applies to you or know folks who that applies to, please reach out to us. We And follow us on Twitter at uh, homeless underscore law. That's going to be where we're doing a lot of information and sharing and the best, best place to get involved. Thank you again so much for being here. And I'm going to turn it back over to Michael for uh, a Q&A. And Michael... I have a few questions that have come up a few times, but let me know how you want to do the Q&A. Sure. Before we actually transition to the Q&A, um, and hopefully um, our panelists could answer some of those questions in the chat, um, and and feel free to leave your contact information if folks have any follow-up questions that we may not be able to get to given our limited time today. But I just want to say thank you to the panelists and to the supporting organizations, uh, National Homelessness Law Center, Southern Poverty um, Law Center Results Educational Fund and Miami Coalition to Advance Racial Equity and uh, also the pro bono support we received from Accelerate. Um, so again, before we transition to Q&A, just one minute of your time, we want to close out, before we close out, we want to do a polling question um, just to get a base, like a, an understanding of like how this has been helpful to you. Um, and again, if you have any additional um, ideas um, so the first question is, how much do you agree with the following statement? As a result of this webinar, I learned more about criminalization of homelessness and poverty and how it impacts my community. So again, similar choices as the one that you've seen before, strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, and strongly agree. Um, the second question is, what additional programming will be helpful to support your work in addressing criminalization of homelessness and poverty in your community? Um, and hopefully you can take the time um, to fill in the the 
the questions that we have in the next 20 seconds, and then we'll close it out. And then we'll go ahead and move towards the Q&A. So just give it another 10 seconds. And Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, so why don't we go ahead and turn over to q and I know there have been a few questions, um, actually not a few, several questions that are still um, unanswered. Um, maybe I'll leave it to the panelists. Um, Will if, and, and um, Jesse, are there specific questions that you wanna answer um, while we have everyone on the call? I answered up. so many in writing that I can't remember at this point if there, <laughs> there are any that I needed to answer orally, but uh, I'm doing my yeah. best through them. There are tons of questions and we're not going to be able to get through all of them, but if folks have outstanding questions, feel free to shoot us an email. One of the questions that came up a few times that I'd like for us to talk about is, um, how will this impact the country if the case is, is struck down? Um, if we could talk about that in a non-legal frame for those of us who did not go to law school, that would be really helpful. I, could could you say that again, Jesse? I'm not sure I, I caught. What happens if we lose? Um, well, I, I think we can look at what happened post Dobbs to the entire community uh, advocating for bodily autonomy and um, reproductive liberty. We're in a bad situation then. There will be increased criminalization efforts. Um, a lot of there's a lot of lawsuits around the country that are currently paused or stayed. There are a lot of uh, because of this case waiting to see what happens. There are a lot of places that have not passed similar or worse laws that will then go back to uh, getting them passed. And, and uh, it will result in more invisibilization and criminalization of the unsheltered homeless community for sure. Um, I think that could lead to uh, the question I was actually just answering. The big problem with these cases is that we're not actually fighting for anything that will help, unfortunately. We're fighting to maintain a, a, a very narrow protection, much much the, like, um, like Roe v. Wade was. It wasn't a perfect solution. It didn't provide affirmative protections or rights or services. It, similarly, Martin v. Boise doesn't do that. Grant's past doesn't do that. All they say is that the government can't make things worse by punishing people uh, who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness and they don't have anywhere else to go. We're fighting to maintain that status quo. And if we lose that, things will definitely get worse. Maybe that will lead to enough engagement and attention to actually get the affirmative policy um, measures that we have decades of data showing are proven to help uh, solve homelessness, to help people uh, get back on their feet, uh, housing first specifically. Um, maybe that could happen. I definitely don't want to be in that situation if we can avoid it. But that's that's what's going to happen if we lose. And Will, that brings up a great point that I, that I meant, meant to make earlier. We we know what happens also if we win. Uh, Miami is a great example where David's based out of. Miami was under a similar legal ruling that said you can't punish people for being for sleeping outside if there's not a place for them to go. Uh, and instead of doubling down on criminalization, Miami funded housing and shelter and reduced homelessness by half. This shows that these things are not rocket science, that when we fund housing and services, fewer people sleep outside and fewer people experience homelessness. And that's the message that we want to convey that the Supreme Court can make homelessness worse, but the government can make homelessness better. And we hope that that is the outcome of this case, that not only the Supreme Court uh, doesn't make things worse, but it forces our elected officials at every level of government to fund the housing and services that everybody needs. Thanks, Jesse. Um, just intervening here real quick, because I know we're we're almost at time, but um, there was a question about, is there an effort to create or begin a federal legislative fix in the event of a bad ruling? And I think that's such a great question, because oftentimes what we see is when the court hands out a decision, regardless of the outcome, there's some type of response from Congress. And I was wondering if any of you could talk briefly about that. Maybe, Jesse, maybe that's like a question that you can answer. I'm also happy to chime in since uh, I'm familiar. 
It's something we're thinking about. Um, right now, we're really working on educating members of Congress that the case is even going on, um, but are excited to you know use this as a relationship building tool and a tool to push them to enact policy that ends homelessness. And and to Jesse's point, you know, just go to their website, and this is like an like it's it's a live issue, it's ongoing. So the strategizing about like what the federal legislative fix is, like those are ongoing conversations. So again, the best way to plug in is to go through the National Homelessness Law Center's website or the Johnson um, Grants Pass v. Johnson website that they have shared in the chat, um, and. You know, again, this is this is a series of webinars that we will be doing in the next couple of months leading up to and after the court hands out the ruling. Um, so please make sure to stay tuned. Um, there are other questions and I'm not sure we're at time, unfortunately. So what we can do is if folks could leave, you know, if you want to share your email addresses um, on the chat um, for folks who have follow-up questions, please feel free to do so now. Um, and again, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who attended and joined us in today's discussion. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in future programming around this case um, and uh, the criminal addressing the criminalization of homelessness and poverty writ large. So please stay tuned. We'll do a follow-up um, include and include the webinar recording in that follow-up email that you'll receive. So thank you all so much. And with that, um, this webinar is adjourned. Thank you so much.